The earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. The earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. Let's just pause and just think about that right now. We are in the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah, which is, starts on Friday night, but that's the day that, that we commemorate God creating man. And right now we're in the days of creation. And, and there are right now, we, if we open our eyes, there are more angelic ones here in this room than there are. It's just filled with angelic ones. There's much, many, many more than, than the earthly saints in this room. And every one of them witnessed the creation of time. Everyone was there when, they, when God all of a sudden spoke out and said, Light be. And when you ask, they say it was a glorious time. It was a time of, of holding their breath to say, what's next? What is God going to do next? Because the glory of God filled the universe at the time. And the glory of God fills the universe now. Today we celebrate the second day. And, as, and the more we press into these days of creation, the more we can partner with the Lord and more that we can see the beginning so that we can know the end. And they just said it's just it was a glorious time because every day something new is happening. Hallelujah. These same angelic ones whom we know and whom you know some we we don't, but a lot we know and we work with all the time. And yet they were there and they saw this happening. And now we're going into this new um, year on Friday, Rosh Hashanah, and and it, it's it's like every. Every day is a new thing. It's a new time. And we need to take that time to meditate on it, to, to think about it, to say, what do you want to show us today about it, Lord? It's not a time just to go about business as usual. It's a time to press in to the things that the Lord would have us to see. And yeah, and, and while we were, we were worshiping and, and, and I was reminded about this. So I was reminded that they were there, that they witnessed this. And I was also reminded that all the way through the years, they witnessed the appointed times. They, they, they watched as Seth and Enoch and Methuselah, even Enoch had prophesied about the great flood coming, and then Methuselah and Lamech, and Noah was born. And, and they watched it until it was an appointed time, and God shut the door of the ark. They, they, they witnessed the fact when Abraham was promised a son, and, and every day, Abraham, is it today? Is it today? And, and 25 years later, it was that day, it was the appointed time. Amen. They witnessed the, the times that, that Zacharias and Elizabeth prayed for a child. And then they witnessed them saying, I guess not, we'll just have spiritual kids. And then they, were, they witnessed the fact when Gabriel came and talked to Zacharias and said, now is the appointed time. And they witnessed Zechariah saying, "I don't think so." And and I was and I was admonished to don't be that way. When it's the appointed time, yes. rejoice, yes. even if you don't see it. Zechariah had another nine months to go. He had to go and act on that promise, but he had another nine months to go before he saw the the fruition of that. Yes. And and we need to always. Wait with bated breath. Is today the appointed time, and 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 I, I was just reminded how they witnessed. They said there was there's been many appointed times over the centuries, and every time people waited with bated breath. But when the appointed come, time comes, it comes with great rejoicing. And if we look at today, today was a historical day. Today they signed the Abraham Accord, and. It's for all the children of Abraham to come together in peace. It's a historic day. And yet, how many people have prayed over this? 
How many people have prayed through the centuries for peace? How many people, even since the day of Ishmael and Isaac separating, they prayed for a time when the brothers would come back together. When, when Abraham had the other five sons and sent them away, they're saying, is there a time when Abraham's children will be reunited? And today, with bated breath, we saw the beginning of that. You know, it's an appointed time. It's that time that we have, to, we have to rejoice in and we have to pay attention to and we have to know it's not just another day that something important happened on this day and this is, and this is why. So we're going into the year 5781. 5,781 years ago, give or take. Years because of the Babylonian exile. But basically 5,781 years ago, God said for the waters to separate. Let the waters above be separate from the waters beneath. And, and we're going into this new era and we need to understand what it is. Um, this head of the year. Gloria Zion, I like what they call it, the year of the apostolic authority. Another ministry called it a year to widen your mouth in silence. I really like that one. A year to widen your mouth in silence. Because sometimes it's just wisdom to, to, to not say nothing. Anyway. But if we look at that, you know, we're, of course, we're in the decade of the mouth, decade of pay, which is mouth communication. And we're going into the year Aleph which is strong, it's power, but it's also the ox, which is the apostle. But remember the Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet, but it's that letter that always brings you back to God. It's that, it's that, um, that Yud on top and Yud on bottom with the Vav in between. It's that, that, that connection between God. That this is the year that we can come back into connection, strong connection, to go back to keep going forward in in this um, assignment that God has assigned for us. It's not the year to just go running our mouth. That's why I think I like that a year to widen your mouth in silence. Just because we can have the apostolic authority doesn't mean we need to go running our mouth. We need to walk in 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 wisdom. We need to walk in in in. Um, I don't want to say on eggshells because we're not walking on eggshells, but we're walking um, with purpose, carefully, placing every foot where God would tell us to, to place. And I was looking at a couple of verses in, in, in uh, Psalms, and there's just like a few verses out of Psalms that, I, that, that has hit me. In Psalms 37... Psalms 37, verse 30. I always write it down, but I still like to look them up. Um, 37, verse 30. And 31. You know, before we get to this, I can't get past this. When I was talking about the appointed times, when the Israelites went into Egypt... They had been prophesied through Abraham that they were going to go and they were going to sojourn in the land for, 40, for 400 years. So you have Abraham, Isaac, and his son, grandson Jacob is the one who took them into is, uh, to Egypt. Okay, and they lived there in the land of Goshen. But when Joseph died, remember that he said, "Don't when you leave this land, carry my bones with me, with you. Don't leave me in this land. Carry my bones with you. Okay, 400 years later, or probably 380, I never counted them up, but somewhere around there, over 300 years, 350 years later, is the day, the appointed time they left. And that day they picked up Joseph's bones and carried them with them. It was the appointed time. Appointed time that Joseph saw hundreds of years before a time. And, and when, but when, but, but for them to know to carry Joseph's bones, they talked about it every night around the campfire. Yes. They told the stories. They remembered why they were there. 
they remembered, yeah, we're in Egypt now and we're slaves now, but the Lord's already promised that we were coming out of this. See, even when they, they, they built the, they had the bricks and they did the mud bricks all over and over and they were just worn out, smooth out and they came back around the fire and they ate their little uh, onions and, and leeks and, and all the stuff they wanted and the melons that they wanted in the wilderness. But they were eating these things in their homes and they were talking about there's going to be a day we're leaving. There's going to be a appointed time. And so even while we're walking through this and we have the prophecies and we're walking into this new year, we need to take this, this season of being in the mouth and talk about it to our children, talk about it to those who's coming along after us, talk about the prophecies. Not everybody understands the prophecies. Not everybody understands where we've been. Not everybody understands where we're going. We need to write the vision because even every day a new person's coming in. They don't know where we've been. They don't know what Ron and Connie's gone through to start Kingdom Mandate and to have the Solution Church. They don't know what it, what it cost them in all these years, and yet they're coming alongside them. And, and, but, if, when, but every time Ron and Connie talks about it, it brings them into remembrance, and it brings everybody back to the same page. When the children See, it wasn't the same people that went into Egypt that left Egypt. It wasn't even their children. It was their children's children's children. How many children happens in 400 years? Okay, so they had to pass these stories down and had to pass the, the burning vision that they were going to leave this place down from child to child to child so that the day that they left, they remembered to take their grand, great, great, great grandfather's bones with them. So we're going into a place, they don't know where we've been. When I go, you know, as we go into this new season and people look and say, oh, look at you, you haven't made. No, you don't know where we've been. You don't know the turtle pies. You don't know. <laughs> Are the turtle, what's it called? Turtle loaf, turtle loaves. You don't, you don't know the times that we've laid on this carpet and cried. You don't know the times that we've gathered our hands and said, we got to have a miracle today and we need to pray. You don't know the times Tim Melvin has sat on these steps and prayed for the ceiling tiles. You know, wh how will we know unless we tell them? And then, and then say, but even then, even then we were promised that we were going to go here. See, that's where we're going into. But we have to be able to show people and tell people and, and have that vision burn in them because they're coming along with us not knowing, but they can be a part of it. Because it wasn't the people that came into Egypt that came out with the gold and the silver. How many of you, how many, I mean, I don't know that I would have had enough nerve to go to my mistress and say, I want your gold and silver now. But see, they've been prophesied that in Abraham's time, that they were going to go out with the riches of Egypt. And then when Moses the prophet came and said, this is what you're going to do, they said, well, we've been hearing these stories all of our lives. So let's just do it and see what happens. And they left with all the riches of Egypt, carrying the bones of their great-great-great-grandfather. But if, they, if, 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 the, if the fathers hadn't been, hadn't been faithful in telling the stories, they would never have known. And they would have been so comfortable in their place that they would say, no, we want to stay here. We know out there is a desert. We don't want to go. They would have been so comfortable in their way of life that they wouldn't have gone. But because their fathers and their mothers were faithful in telling the stories, they knew they had to do it because this was the prophecy of God Almighty. Now, they still complained when they got out there. But if they did not know the prophecies, they would never have gone in the first place. So, so we have to be faithful because we're those, yes, we remember those who've gone before behind us and, and we remember the heavenly saints and that's why we always honor them here. That's why we always honor them. That's why we tell their stories. That's why we, we, we um, love for them to be here and, and their encouragement. But 
guess what? We're part of those that's going to be, people's going to come after us. And we have to be faithful to give those stories so those who's coming can know. Yes. Yes. That was nowhere in my notes. But yeah, here we go. <laughs> but that's where we're going. We're going into this new year. We've got to remember where we've been, but remember where we're going. We have to know that this is, hey, this is a time when, when the heavens are open. This is a time when God wants to rain down his grace on us. This is his, this is his sent, uh, thousand years of grace. But we're going into the year 81, which is the mouth of communication. It's powerful communication. But then let's go back to Psalms Get back to 37, verse 30. It says, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. Oh, let's go f even further. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. And the mouth of the righteous will speak wisdom and his tongue talk of justice. The law of God is in his heart and none of his steps shall slide. See, the mouth of the righteous utter wisdom. And if we're going into this time and we're the righteous, we're going to have to understand that wisdom. We have to understand how to connect God with us and how to, how to always go back to God and how to be that leader in wisdom. Psalms 1914, you guys know this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you in, the, in thy sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. But then if you go over to Psalms 49.3, I know I'm just going really, really quick. But Psalms 49.3, it says, My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be understanding. See, we're going into this time of the mouth, or we are already in this time of the mouth, and this time of Aleph, and we have to understand that our mouth needs to speak wisdom. But how does that wisdom connect? We have to connect it with understanding. And that is the meditation of our heart shall be understanding. So we know the simplistic definition of wisdom is to know about something. That's very simplistic. But understanding is to know how to use that. So we can have wisdom, but we have to meditate on it to have the understanding. So the meditation of our heart is the understanding. So if we <laughs> go back just a few verses in Psalms 37, it says, and this is one that we quote all the time, it's the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Now, if this is though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Okay, if we take that and we can memorize it and we can say that every day, and we do say that a lot. I mean, I pray that every day. Let this, my steps be ordered of the Lord. We can say that, we can memorize that, and that's wisdom. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. But we can quote it all day long, but unless we understand how to put it into practice, it never does, amounts to anything. Quoting the scripture doesn't matter unless you understand how to put it into practice. Um, so, so we have to, like in this, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Well, do you have to, if you don't hear God and obey him, your steps aren't going to be ordered. God can order them. He can speak them. He can write them on the scrolls. We say every night when we come in here, let us be aligned and let us do what's on the scroll. But if we're not going to hear it, then it doesn't matter because we're not going to do it anyway. You know, if we're not partnering with God, if we're not aligning with him every day, then how are our steps going to be ordered? So we have to have that understanding. Anyone can memorize. I know people that, can, that has memorized books and books of the Bible, but they have no concept on what it means. So, as a teacher, this, I, I'm, I'm like, unless a person can tell me back in their own words what it says, they don't know it. So, I, I, I put much more stock in paraphrasing it in your own words than memorizing it. Now, I'm not saying it's not important to memorize the scripture. It is. Okay? It says, you know, that word have I hid in my heart. Well, when you memorize the scripture, then even if you don't have the Bible in front of you, you can be meditating on it and the Lord can be given you revelation. But if you don't have it memorized, then you're going to be paraphrasing and you only have that, that understanding. Understanding only goes so far. Wisdom is boundless because wisdom's of God. 
Well, I mean, understanding is too, but wisdom goes even higher than the understanding. Does that make sense? Am I making sense there? Okay, so we, so for us to um, go into this, this time of the, of the mouth and speaking, we need to understand we can speak scripture, but as we meditate on it, as we think on it, break it down in our heart, we can bring understanding. And we, and we have to have the understanding with it. Because I know people, I, I was friends with this lady, and um, she was a wonderful woman of God. You know, she had lots of experience, knew a lot of people, all this. But when she spoke, she was, and when she prayed, she prayed, I pray, and she just quote these, the, the references. Isaiah 61, 1, and Psalms 37, 23. And I know John 17, and I'm thinking, I have no clue what you're saying. I'm sure you do, but I'm not good at references and addresses, so sure, you know. But she would go, and, and she would tell the lady at the grocery store, well, you know, according to John 17, 17, and or whatever it is, and, and I'm thinking, this lady doesn't have any more clue than I do. It doesn't matter the address. What matters is the word in it. These words are God's words. So am, is it true you need to memorize scripture? Yes. But it's, it's true that you have to speak it in, in a language that people can understand and that you can understand. So wisdom is important. And, and if we go to, I love wisdom. Wisdom 8, I mean Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8 talks all about wisdom, so I, I like to go over to that. But, you know, in, in verse 11, it says, Wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things one may desire cannot compare with her. You know, and this is true. Wisdom is, is so precious and so um, unlimited. I mean, every time you think you know something and you sit down with wisdom, you find more. I mean, it's just, she's just unending. But, in verse 12, it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. And I looked at prudence because I looked at prudence. Anyway, but in my definition of prudence would be planning in, a practical, in, in practical affairs. It's, it's planning for things practically, especially economic things. But wisdom dwells in that practical. Wisdom's not just out there, you know, why is the sky blue? Wisdom is for practical things. And that's where she dwells. Okay, I wisdom dwell in prudence. I find out knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and perverse mouth I, mouth I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. If you ever think about that, that's the seven wisdom spirits of God. But, but that all comes back to wisdom. Then verse 15, by me kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me princes rule and nobles and all the judges of the earth. So see, when we have wisdom, we're supposed to be kings in the earth. We're supposed to rule and reign in the earth. But without wisdom, you're not going to reign properly. So without wisdom, you're never going to speak properly. If you think about it, the mouth is full of teeth and teeth symbolize wisdom. So when we're talking about the, the, the decade of the mouth, we ha it's... it's Every time it's about wisdom. Every single time it's about wisdom. And wisdom is, is in, this, in this year, the Aleph, the year that always brings it back to God, we need to understand that we need to reign in this wisdom that brings everything back to God. So in this year that we, we, that we step forward, we open our mouths with a apostolic authority and with power, you have to have a very intimate relationship with wisdom. And it says, and with wisdom, get understanding. You can have all the wisdom in the world. If you don't have understanding to know what to do with it, it's useless. So all the seven spirits of the Lord are, are important. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have the fires before them with the seven spirits of God in them. But, it's, but wisdom has been, has been given much, many scriptures in the, and, and the whole chapters in the Bible and so you need to really press into wisdom. Wisdom, when talking about this is the, we're celebrating the creation of time, wisdom was there. 
Um, I, I love it. And if you go on down, I won't read it all for time's sake, but if you go on down like verse 22, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of, of his way. And it talks about in the beginning before there was ever an earth, there was wisdom. While, while as yet he had not made earth or the fields or the primal dust of the earth, of the world. There's all kinds of tidbits in there. But I'll, anyway. But in verse 30, I was, then I was, wisdom was beside him as a master craftsman. I was daily his delight rejoicing before him. When you want to create something, the best way to do it is ask wisdom because wisdom was a master craftsman. Wisdom helped God create the earth. So whenever you want creativeness, dig in there. Dig into wisdom. Wisdom is a, is a wonderful lady who loves to, to have relationship with everyone. So we need to understand wisdom. But, this, but when we're going into this year, we know that we're going into it with apostolic authority, with, with power in our mouth. But that power is to bring everything back around to God and to God's glory. Okay, so um, you know, and, and always said, you know, our mouth is full of, of of God's word. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. The way it's acceptable is that it's God's word in our in our mouth, not our words. You know, Psalms one nineteen says, "Direct my steps by your word." It's His word, and and we have to understand. We have to understand God's word, not. And and I'm 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 not go back. I just really feel compelled right now to 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 push into. You know, we have the prophetic word, we have the revelatory words, we have. All, but God's word, these written words in this in these sixty six books are God's word. And and we we cannot minimize them, and we cannot. They're they're holy. They're holy, and and we have and and I just how do I say this. In this season and in this time, the church is all about revelation, or a lot of our circle, all about revelation, all about digging into the mysteries. It's all about the prophetic. It's all about visions and dreams, and it's all about angelic visitations. But, but we forget how important the written word is. These 66 books, you know, you guys in here know me. Yeah, I read a lot. I've read extensively. I like to read all the Enoch and Jasher and Jubilees and the Gnostic books. I like to read the first century fathers. I like to read other people's books. I like to, you know, I have angelic visitations, all this stuff. But there's absolutely nothing of God ever, ever, ever contradicts these words, the, the books, the words in this book. And, 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 where we're going, we have to totally believe these 66 books without hesitation. We have to trust that every word is true. If you think there's a contradiction, go back to the original language. But there's no contradiction in here. And you have to be so dogmatic about that. That has to be one of those things that's uncompromised. Do you know what I'm saying? No matter where we go, you cannot compromise the fact that this is God's holy scripture. This is spoken by God. It's supernaturally put into place. And we've had it. People have died for this book. And, 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 and there's, there's nothing in it that's not true. You have to be so uncompromising about it. Nothing in it is not true. You, you, people will try and say, oh, you know, is man that wrote it down so there's there's something's not right about it or you know this was this was not right historically whatever no this is true this is true and we have to understand that 
We can't go, you know, my teacher was trying to tell me, and I, and at first season, I haven't even believed. Well, you know, a thousand words. So in, in creation, we don't know how long those days were. But the Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. We have to believe that. Because if you start questioning Genesis 1, you're not questioned all the way through. But it has to be so so dogmatic that you have to understand it. So even, and, and, I, and I'll tell you, and especially because of where we're going, and because we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, tra we're not only a revival center, but we're a training facility, I'm gonna, I, I will be really strict on saying, you know, I, don't, I don't even think somebody needs to read Enoch, Jasher, Jubilees, or the Gnostics until you have a working understanding of these scriptures. Because you can get to, off too fast. Yes, I believe there's other scriptures out there, but these have been had been canonized. These have been set in stone. These have been the, these these books. They find they find um, copies of it years later, and there's nothing changed in it. It's the same book. Enoch, you can't say that of. You can't say where is. I mean, yes, there's a copy of Enoch on the Ark, but there hasn't been the same. Um, sacred attention to every dot and every tittle in the book of Enoch as there is in these scriptures. So these are the scriptures that are true. You cannot change these, these 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. Okay? So even before you study the Christian mystics, before you, I would say, before you could enter into the fullness of your position in any position, whether you're a seer, prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, you can never enter into the fullness of your appointment until you have a working knowledge of this Bible. And I might be wrong, and I might be really dogmatic, but this is how I feel. I really, truly believe this because I've seen too many people get off in it. And, and in, this, in this time, we're going into the season of the mouth, and if you're off one little dot, you're off. And if you don't understand... Why, why was a peace agreement entitled the Abrahamic, uh, Abraham Accord? And why is that important? If you don't know the scripture, you don't know that. Why is it important? It's not just about, not just about Isaac and Ishmael. What about the other five sons? Why is that important? If you don't understand that, how are you going to answer if you don't understand the, the elementary, you know, Hebrews talks about the elementary things. And, and I think that this is elementary before you go anywhere else. Because if you don't understand this, if you don't know the timeline, if you don't know what the Bible the, it's, it's talking about, then you're going to get off. Because even when I was reading the Gnostics, I could, I could read... And I would go along and all of a sudden there would be something that was contradictory to these scriptures and I would immediately stop. Because nothing contradicts these, the scripture. But if you keep reading, you're going to get off. And I've seen people, I've seen leaders get off because they say, well, I can, I can, I can um, explain it. Don't try and explain away these scriptures. This is the word of God. This is the supernatural word of God. You can't not I, 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 you can't explain it away. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be a scholar and you have to know every, everything about everything, but you have to be a student. And you have to be, be study it. Because even, when, even for those of us who, are, who just have visions and dreams, I'm not saying just visions and dreams, but if you don't have that scripture in you, you're going to get off. And, and you have, so you have to understand it. And it's not, and when, you, when you sit down with wisdom and you sit down with Holy Spirit, it's not boring. You know, um, yeah, I'm on my soapbox, but yeah, whatever. Um, Bill Johnson and Jeff Jansen posted a, a, a page out of a Smith Wigglesworth's Bible and Smith Wigglesworth was one of my heroes. I love Smith, and, 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 I, and he was a man full of power. But the thing is, is he didn't read anything else except the Bible. But this is what, the, what he wrote in his, in, in, his, in his Bible. 
He said, never compare this book with other books. Comparisons are dangerous. Never think a day that this book contains the word of God. It is the word of God. It is supernatural in origin, eternal in duration, unexpressible in value, infinite in scope, regenerative, regenerative, regenerative in power, infallible in authority, universal in interest, personal in application, inspired in totality. Read it through, write it down, pray it in, work it out, and pass it on. It is the Word of God. Smith Wigglesworth was such a man of power that he believed and taught that this Bible is supernatural. And we have to get that back. We have to get the holiness back. I remember when um, we, were, we have some friends who are um, in China, and I used to do their newsletter. But it made an impact on me because you know they said you know we come back to the states and we just we just put our Bibles underneath the seats on the floor we just you know wherever we not put our Bible, and he said you would never see a Chinese person putting their floor on their their Bible on the floor because they 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 know what it means to give their life for one page, one single page of this Bible they know what it means to go to uh, work camp. They know what it means to be shot on sight if they had one single page. And they would take a Bible and they would, they would take it apart and they would pass out the pages and they would read it and, and they would memorize it and then they would pass it on to the next person. And yet we have so many Bibles that we just toss it here and there, but we forget that this is supernatural. This is a supernatural world, word. And unless we can understand it and unless we can read it with that supernatural understanding we're not going to go where we need to go and again I'm not saying that we all have to be scholars and Greek scholars and Hebrew, Hebrew scholars and all that but I'm saying that when you're sitting down and you're studying this and you're reading it with, with wisdom when you're reading this with, with Holy Spirit then you come into an understanding of it. And you have to have the understanding, a working understanding of it, before you go to any of these extracurricular stuff. If you never get past the, the understanding of it, if you're always studying it, that's fine. There is nothing more important than these 66 books. Everything is included in them. Because when you start going to these other books, when you start looking into the mysteries, you start saying, oh, well, that's the mystery. Okay, that's the, the spiritual law. And then you go right back to the scriptures. Oh, well, it's always, it's always been here. It's in the Bible anyway. You just don't see it that way. But the laws are there. Every single law that I've been shown, the spiritual laws, every single thing I've been shown from the ancient ways is in the scripture. When an angel comes up to me and says, yeah, we were there, we witnessed that. It's in the scripture. Job says, where were you when the, when the sons of the morning sang? When the angelic ones went. It's in the scripture. When, I, when you go to the council room and you have these plans and understandings, it says, well, have you not gone to the council chambers of the Lord? It's in the Bible. And, and yet, we, we, we want to have the the supernatural way out there experiences or we want to study the mysteries, but all along the mysteries are right in front of us. And I'm not discounting revelation. I'm not discounting the experiences. I'm not discounting dreams and visions. I mean, a third of this thing is visions and dreams. I'm not discounting that. I'm not discounting the fact that there's other books out there. But if you don't know this book first, you don't know nothing. And, you know, if, if uh, Steve said... Bring out this scripture. I'm going to bring out this scripture. 1 Timothy, verse 3. And it's talking about um, the qualifications of a bishop. But in verse 3, verse 6, it says, um, or, it says, not a novice. And this, this, is, giving, this is giving the... Um, huh? 1 Timothy 3. This is giving the qualifications of a bishop. 
You know, it must be blameless. The bishop, verse two, the bishop must be, um, well, verse, uh, starting at verse one. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. So first they have to desire this work. Then he must be blameless, a husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Verse 6, not a novice, lest being puffed with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So see, that's what, when we start talking about, when I, when I start saying, if you don't understand the scriptures, you're never going to be in the fullness of your position. It's because as a novice, if you don't understand this, you're a novice. And it's elementary things. And a novice means a new thing, a new person. Why you don't put a new person in a position if you don't you don't lift them up, you don't elevate them? Because they'll because they become puffed up with pride, like the enemy. And so we so you have to be careful, not a novice. Well, a novice can be a novice for a day if they understand. If, if the Lord gives them that supernatural knowledge, supernatural wisdom. I've seen people, well, even the woman at the well, the Lord said she was the first evangelist. She went back and said everything that Jesus did, you know. So I, I'm not saying a novice has to be 20 in the, in the, in the church for 20 years. And uh, you can grow however fast or slow you choose to grow in the spirit realm. But, if a person doesn't understand the scriptures, then, then you're not going to be able to stand in a position. You can't stand in the position of a seer and say, well, this is what I see, but these are the scriptures. So, and they say, well, what does that mean? Hmm. Well, where's the, where's the scripture that's based on? I don't know. Well, what's about it? I don't know. If you know Barbie's dream book better than you know the Bible, something's wrong. Because the Bible's full of dreams. If you, because the, the, the Lord said, you know, Joseph didn't have Barbie's dream book, believe it or not. I love Barbie. But she didn't. He, 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 they knew that based on what? On Holy Spirit, on what was taught. And, and sometimes we forget that the symbolism in the scripture is also dream language. The symbolism in the scripture is also vision language. The symbolism, the parables, Jesus taught by parables. He taught by stories. If you're a storyteller, why aren't you telling stories? Well, you have to go back and understand the stories Jesus told. And then start telling the stories. And so I, I'm, I know I'm pressing this in, but I, I just feel like we, we, we kind of brush it aside. Yeah, I know that and brush it aside. I'd rather do this. And, and I'm saying that we can't brush it aside anymore. We have to be instant, the Bible says be instant in, in season and out to give answers whenever, whatever is asked. That's Debbie paraphrase, I know. But you have, to, you have to be able to give an answer at any time for any way. Well, you have to give an answer based on scripture. And how are you going to do that unless you hide his word in, in your heart? How are you going to do that unless you understand it yourself? How, how do you understand the power of the blood, of, truly understand the power of the blood of Jesus unless you understand the sacrifice and why the sacrifices were being made? How do we truly understand the importance of the Abraham, uh, Abraham Accord today and the fact that they went in and had lunch together after they signed? Most people said, oh, they had a working lunch. Cool. No, they had a covenant meal. What does that mean? They broke bread together. What does that mean? That's what Laban did with, Ab uh, with uh, Jacob. What does, I, mean, that's, I mean, over and over in the scriptures, they broke bread. Last, last supper was a covenant meal. And, and yet we, we brush it aside. No, that's not that important. Yeah, it's important. You know, yeah, if you want to know the mysteries, you better know the mysteries of the scriptures. And, and I can't, and that's why I'm, 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 I'm really trying to stress it because, again, I see it over and over and over in, in our society right now. And I, 
saw someone on Facebook today trying to explain some stuff, and I'm like, it's not based on Scripture. Base it on Scripture. And then explain it from the Scripture. Why, why say, well, guru so-and-so said this, and, and I've you know, I I was, I was been listening to this, this guy, and I would not recommend other people listening. This is just something that popped up, and I was like, oh, okay, that gives me an insight. But if I was going to quote him, what is the purpose? He's not a believer. But I can say, oh, well, you know, I, I get that point and I, that, that made sense, but this is what the scripture says about it. I can tell you exactly what's false about it. And I can tell you what's true about it. But if I didn't understand the scripture, I wouldn't. And that's why I don't tell everybody, yeah, I go listen to so-and-so. Because if they, but most of the time I'm finding out people don't understand the scripture. Or they say they do and they understand the, they understand the hundred verses that Ron preaches about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, but seriously, we hear in, in 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 our in our circles, we hear the same verses over and over. And and there's nothing wrong with that. There's also other verses that we pull out. And we're like, oh yeah, I forgot that was in there. Oh yeah, I forgot that was in there. But the same verses, we think, well, we got it because we know these verses. Yeah, we're word of faith. We know Mark eleven twenty three. We got it unless you put an understanding and you understand what the basis is, do you understand that mountains were talking about being moving and jumping and shouting for joy in the Old Testament? Jesus, everything he taught, he built on the Old Testament. But do we understand that? You know, there's, there's whole denominations that don't even read the Old Testament. Oh, it's past. No, it's not past. It's living. It's alive. And, and the more we understand that this scripture is living, alive, and active, the, it's supernatural. It's the word of God. It's like every word that comes out of God's mouth. This is every word that comes out of God's mouth. This is what is so precious. People have died for this. People have shed their blood for this. People have hidden it and, and, and taken it out on, on pain of death. And yet, we need to stop brushing aside. We need to stop saying, oh, we, we got it. I'd rather have the mysteries. We, we, we need to understand this is the mystery. I'm not knocking. You guys understand my heart. Please understand my heart because you know I like mysteries more than anybody. And I like to, like to study more than anybody. You guys know I, I love to read. I love that stuff. But before I was ever allowed to do that, I sat in my room, and this is after years, all my life studying the scriptures. I mean, as a missionette, I had to memorize, I had to read it frontward and backward, I think three times. I mean, there was, there was things, I, 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 I had to study the scripture all my life from the time I was a child. But before I ever went into any of the mysteries, when I first started, under, or Steve was first starting to tell me, this is real, these revelations, these visions are not just my imagination, for three months, I had to sit there with the Bible, a dictionary, the Strong's Concordance, and Holy Spirit, and read it all again with fresh understanding, with fresh eyes, with, with wisdom, and with the Holy Spirit sitting right there beside me in the bed, saying, this is what is true. If you can understand this, and this is what is true, then you can go to the next step. And, and that's where we need to go back to. Can you sit there without somebody else regurgitating the word, without a con concordance, without anything else except a Bible and a... And a com oh, not, okay, with a commentary. If you can sit there with a concordance, because most people don't know Greek and Hebrew, a concordance can help, help you understand the words. Uh, dictionary is really good. I mean, like even today, I sat there and I looked up prudence because I thought I understood prudence, but how do you explain prudence? How do you, how do you, you know, how do you define it? If you understand to sit there with a dictionary, with the Greek and, and Hebrew concordance, and the Bible with Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit's the author, and understand that, that's when you have the foundation where you can go on to some of these other things. 
And then as we open our mouth and we speak with authority, we're not speaking with what we think. And we're not trying, trying to quote, well, this is the mystery, or this is what Angel Gabriel showed me, or this is what Michael showed me, or this is what Smith Wigglesworth showed me, but this is the word that came out of God's mouth. What's more powerful? So go back. All, all wisdom, all, all the mysteries is nothing if you don't understand the word of God and how supernatural it is and how important it is. All the dreams, all the visions is nothing unless you can back it up with scripture. Period. Because if you don't, you're going to get off. And that's not where we want to go. So even as we, we already talked about that, even as are the staff and, and we've, we've as, as a staff, we've talked about this you know, as we go into training and go into some of the deeper stuff and the mysteries and stuff. We're going to have to, we, we have to have proof that the students who go into the deeper stuff understand, have a working knowledge. Because why, why go into the deep if you don't know, understand the elementary? And so it's that important. And so that's why I just felt like we, we need to, I don't know, put it on tape or something, because you guys all in here know my heart. But um, have it on record that we believe the Bible is the infallible word of God. Everything in it is true. Everything in it is, 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 uh, you, can, is you can trust it. There's nothing false about it at all. Not one dot, not one tittle. Nothing is inaccurate in it. Everything is accurate and truthful. And, and this is the foundation on which we stand. So no matter what revelation, no matter what doctrine comes around, no matter what, if an angel of light comes and stands in front of us and gives us a, his own story, if it doesn't line up with his word, then we're not going there. We're not going to believe it. We're not even going to give it the time of day. So have that same conviction. If you do not have the, if you don't have that conviction, if you don't have that, I mean, there's things we can compromise on. This is not one. And if you don't have that dogmatic black and white conviction, you don't need to be studying it or you don't need to be going anywhere else. So, because this is true. And, this, and, and God's word is supernatural, and it is the word of God. And, it, it, and, and the Bible says he, he, was the, he, he came, he was the word. So this is, if we even look at it that way, this is the body of Christ. This is Christ himself. When, when you take communion, you're taking his body, you're taking his word. And if you're not believing that this is his word, and you're not believing that this word is true, you better not be taking communion. I mean, it's just that black and white. There's certain things that you can. There's certain things that you can compromise. This is not one. You have to be that dogmatic about it. You have to understand it. That's why a lot of people. The, he, Paul said that's why a lot of people are sick and dying because they take communion unworthily. Why? Because they don't understand it. They don't understand that that body of Christ is this word. That that body of Christ is the word is 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 the the flesh that was rent. That's the veil that we go in through. They don't understand those things. They don't understand how all the things that happens when you take communion. They don't understand the covenant meal, and that's why secret people are sick and dying. That's what Paul said, and that was back then. How much more so now? And that's why that's why we have to be that black and white. We have to be that straight about it. And, and, and you guys know, I love mysteries more than anybody. I've already said that. I love going there. I love the goosebumps. I love the songs and the dance and flags, and I love all that stuff. But, but in truth, there's nothing more important than the Word of God. And so we have to, I don't care how pretty the song is. I'm not going there, Ron. But I don't care how pretty the song is. You don't have to sing it. If it's not according to the Word, don't even sing it. There's, when we were at the other church and, and, and they were singing hymns or even there's a lot of songs now that I would just I would not even sing because it's totally against the word of God. Why would I have that out of my mouth? You know, and, and I mean, I've had arguments 
arguments. Well, this scripture, God gives and he takes away. You got to understand that you're, you're taking it totally out of context. Don't even tell me that. Why would, I, why would I sing that and bring doubt in my life and doubt in somebody else's next to me life? You have to understand what, I mean, just because Job said it, why would, Job was written even before Abraham, even before the Mosaic Covenant. Understand that. He was walking in the knowledge that he had. If you, if you study the scriptures, you can see the progression of the relationship with God all the way through the scriptures to this point. Job knew God as the God who thundered and the God who, who, who allowed all that stuff to happen because there was no protection. There was no blood. There was no sacrifice. Even though Job sacrificed because Abraham, I mean Adam sacrificed, there was nothing there. It, it faded. You get up to, to Abraham and his relationship and there was another relationship with God and then you get with Moses and there was another relationship with God. Then you get with Jesus and there's another relationship that we have. But then you go one even step further, and when Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, that is the era that we live in, and that's a relationship we can have. And yet we're even growing even more into that. But if all you have to do is read the scriptures and see, and know where the scriptures are written, and why they're written, what they're written, and, and, and understand that David, even though he saw in today's, in, in today, um, in today's, time he lived in the time before Christ so take that into account I mean you have to understand this to have true understanding does that make sense but this Bible is true don't compromise on it and 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 be a student of the word rightly dividing the word so that you can be acceptable before the Lord amen Okay, that's my soapbox. Okay, grab that bar of soap. <clears throat> grab the soapbox. I turn it to you. Oh, thank you. Good word, Miss Debbie. To go along with that, not to any way steal your thunder, sister. It was good thunder, if anything. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 17 reads as follows. Well, verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived as the time progresses, as the end times come upon us. But continue thou. Paul is talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy, and his, his letter is to Timothy, his spiritual son, or like his, uh, the youth pastor coming up, being a pastor. He says, but continue thou. You continue in the things which you have learned and you have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. And that, Timothy, from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And this is the scriptures that Debbie's been talking about, is that this is the scriptures that are the bedrock to keep you from being deceived by as sedu seducers and whoever comes on the scene. If you're grounded in the scriptures, they can't mess with you. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to say all scripture. He's talking about the holy scriptures and he makes this statement. He said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So when the scripture is given it wasn't just Bob writing something down. This was a revelation from God that he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's what this scripture is going to bring out. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine. You can teach from it to set up a doctrine for a proof. If someone's in the wrong, you can use the scripture to say, hey, you're in the wrong, and let me show you where. Because in the scripture, this was inspired by God, and it applies to your situation. You can use it for reproof, for correction, 
for instruction in righteousness. So that, verse 17, the man of God, which that would be you and I, may be perfect. If you would be perfect, this is your standard. And I think that's what you're going, what you're hammering home tonight is let's start with this first. If we go and do a thing extracurricular, great. But this is our bedrock. This is where we start from. This is our map. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if we would be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work, and I would say that healing, I would say that raising people from the dead, I would say that laying hands, I would say that giving someone a word of knowledge, these would all be construed as good works. And it seems that all of this is coming from the Word of God. Second Peter verse, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And this is Peter when he's talking about the Lord on the, when, when remember when they were up on the, the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter, James, and John were up there and they saw Jesus transfigured before them. He went and became glowing and that whole thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um... Second Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. Um, well, verse 19. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Knowing this first, here's what we're understanding, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. But the prophecy came not in the old time or in the past by the will of man, but holy men and women of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So what was communicated and what was written down was a download that came from God and it's, I would say it differentiates this word from any other word. To me, any other word would be suspect. Okay? But the Bible plainly claims to be the word of God. And I think we need to set the Bible apart in its authenticity, in its holiness, in its inspiration as being the word of God. Amen? Yes. So, We will use the Word of God as our bedrock. And that's why through the years, I myself also, I wasn't in missionettes, you'll be glad to know. Missionettes are the, are the, are the girls group, be like the Girl Scouts of the Assembly of God Church, where the Rangers were the boys. We each had our, we, 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 we each were grown up in our respective youth groups. But, the Word of God was our bedrock. And through the years, we studied it, we learned it, we listened to it, we, were, we had it preached to us. And that's given us, that's been the bedrock of the understanding. And I, I believe what you're saying is true, that we've seen people that started with the Word of God and somewhere along the, uh, the way, they got off of the Word of God and before it was over, they were in left field. And I think that's what we're concerned about is we don't want people to go off into left field. As long as you stay with the word, there's strength, there's unity, and we can use that as our base. That's what has been inspired according to the word of God. It says this is inspired. So if we just take that as our base camp, then we can go from there in different different ways. But as long as we use that as our as our rock solid foundation, that's where we have our strength. Otherwise, 
that's where that's where a lot of the denominations start. I was talking to a guy two weeks ago, and he sat there, and, and he had been raised in the church for probably, he was in his 60s now. And he told me, he says, well, songs of praise are not worship in the church. And I was like, well then, in his denomination, they did not have any songs and music in the church. And I said, oh, is that right? He said, yes. He said, because that's just self-adulation. It's just self, it's all about, so we don't sing at our church, basically. And I got to thinking about that. Of course, we, I, we didn't get into it, but I was like, hmm, okay. But I thought about David singing, I will sing to the Lord. And all the praise that was all through the Psalms that he and his congregation would, would hear and would speak, but somehow he didn't see that singing was anywhere in there, and that somehow that singing and making a joyful noise and clapping your hands and all that had no bearing on clapping your hands. I, I don't get it, but anyway. So what I'm saying is, is this, the, the scripture is inspired, but if we, somewhere back in the day, they got off the track. Someone didn't like music, and now they've got a whole doctrine. And his whole church, I don't know what they do, but they don't music in church. So, what? Or out of church, yeah. Anyway, it was just so, it was so strange that um, it kind of tilted me. But it, But to me, it brought home a very simple truth, that you can have singing all through the Bible, praising, lifting up your hands, shouting to the Lord, loud sounding symbols. I mean, I could give him a hundred if he let me go. But he couldn't see it. Because somewhere in his doctrine, they said, no, that's not allowed. So we don't do that anymore. And so he could read his Bible and never see it. And to me, I was like, turn the lights on, dude. So anyway, let's... Bring our evening offering. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, thank you. If it's gemstones, if it's oil dripping down from your throne, if it's you. If it's wonders, if it's signs, if it points to you, then everything's fine. If it's you, Jesus, we want it. Heavenly Father. We thank you that we can come into your house. We thank you that you have given us a strong and solid word upon which we can base our very life and the life of our soul and our spirit into eternity upon your word, upon your word that never changes. We thank you that your word is the solid rock. And we thank you, Father God, that you have encouraged us and even commanded us to follow your precepts and not go to the left hand or to the right, only to go straight on. And you said then our steps would be blessed and then we would have great success. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we make another, a renewed commitment this evening to follow your word and to walk in the way that you have laid out so that our feet do not slip. Father God, your word is a light unto our pathway. It is a lamp 
Father God, unto our steps. And Father God, you are guiding us into our future. So Father, in Jesus' name, we commit to follow your way and to follow your will and to follow your word without turning to the left or the right, making it, Father, our guide, making it our light in the darkness to lead us, Father God, in every area of our life. We bless you for your word, Father God. We bless you that you are in your word and that in your word we see you, we see light, we receive instruction, we receive wisdom, we receive understanding, we receive guidance, we receive comfort and strength. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that people have died to give us this word and we esteem it very highly for it is your unbroken and unalterable word. We thank you for the gifts that has been given this evening. We thank you for the offerings, Father, that have been brought. We pray, Father God, that you would increase these offerings that according to your word, Father God, you would bring a mighty harvest that we cannot even contain. We bless you, Father God, in Jesus' name, and we say that signs, wonders, and miracles will follow us as we follow what your word dictates to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So we will see you Thursday evening for our intercession, and you are dismissed. Amen.